Okay, uh, so in some sense, this is a sermon about fishing, yeah? Extreme fishing. But it's much more a sermon about the sort of frustration that comes as part and parcel of that activity. See, fishing at extremes produces exhilaration and frustration. Fishing always produces frustration. Didn't you know that? And so does living as a follower of Jesus Christ in a world that's gone all cockeyed with sin. It produces frustration. It's like it's normal human experience, but it's kind of intensified when you're trying to live for the kingdom of God. Now, you may not be into fishing, you're thinking, oh no, I'm certainly not fishing, right? Don't switch off. Because you may not be into fishing, but you are certainly into frustration. Are you not? Do I see a certain agreement rippling through the place? And this sermon is actually about frustration and faith and the grinding point at the interface between the two of them. And how to grease it. That's what this is about. So we come to the third distinct occasion when Jesus appears to his followers after the resurrection in John's Gospel. There's a lot more times than that going on across the Gospels and outside the Gospels and so on. Because Paul also tells us about it. Okay? But here's the third witness then, if you like. Everything must be proved by the testimony of three witnesses. Here's the third witness where Jesus appears to his followers in John's Gospel. Here's the bodily resurrection of Christ from the dead, and here's the third testimony to it. There was a set of three episodes on that first day of the week, do you remember? And then there was the appearing to Thomas and the disciples a week later in a locked upper room, do you remember? And well, here's the third one. Now, not in Jerusalem anymore, back up in Galilee, where Peter, Thomas, and the rest meet him once more. Seven in total on that occasion. There were other post-resurrection appearances to the women, even to more than 500 people at once. But these are the three episodes that John picks up on to demonstrate the reliability of that central Christian assertion that Christ died and was raised from the dead. And it seems to me Jesus, what he does, he meets his men at a point of extreme frustration. Here we go, this is one to three. Simon Peter, Thomas also known as Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples were together. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them. I'm going fishing. And they said, we'll go with you. So they went out, got into the boat, but that night they caught diddly squat. Notice who they are, where they are, what they're doing, and how it's going. Who? Notice who they are. This seems interesting to me anyway. Only three of the seven disciples get named. Did you notice that? Now when three disciples normally get named, in, certainly in the, in the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, who gets named? The three inner core. Peter, James and John, didn't they? The inner core, the inner three. <coughs> Both seen three. Peter, James and John. Here only three get mentioned, and it's not Peter, James and John. They're there, but... That's not where it's put. John, John must be trying to tell us something here. What's going on? He refers to the sons of Zebedee. He refers to two others. And then this list of three. What's he up to with this list? It's unusual. First name in the list, Peter. What's up with Peter at the moment? Peter is a disciple who has betrayed Jesus. Who's been an eyewitness of his resurrection already in that locked up room twice. But things aren't right. Things aren't right with Peter and Jesus at the moment. And that's what we'll be looking at next week. Okay? At the moment, Peter is a little bit out of sorts. And the relationship there with Jesus is a, a little bit awry. Who else is there? Thomas. Who's Thomas? Thomas is the disciple who'd be unwilling to believe unless he put his hands and his fingers and whatever in to Jesus' side and so on. The disciple would be unwilling to believe until he could prove Christ's wounds, the risen Christ's wounds, but then change his mind about the whole thing as soon as he met Jesus, that second meeting with Jesus. One week later, that the betrayer, the doubter, and Nathaniel. Tell me about Nathaniel. What have we got, Nathaniel? 
Well, that, see? Yeah, yeah. Almost, when there's something unusual in the body, you stop and think about it. You don't suddenly go, oh, I don't understand that, and run away. Right? What's going on? Nathaniel. What do we know about Nathaniel? We've only met Nathaniel once before, and we haven't heard about him since chapter 1, verses 45 to 51. And again, we don't know much about it. It's the only place he's, we're told he comes from Cana, where Jesus' first two signs were done, yeah, in John's Gospel. What do we know about Nathaniel? Here you go. That first calling together of disciples, Philip found Nathaniel and told him, we found the one Moses wrote about in the law, about whom the prophets also wrote. Here's the one that all the Bible points to. Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nazareth? Can anything good come from there, says Nathaniel? Nathaniel knows his Bible. He knows Nathaniel does not figure. And he sees it, but... Now, what are you, you going to say when you're trying to share your faith with somebody? What are you going to come see? Come see. This is why it's important to have a community of the people of God happening, not some formal, rigid, structured church where nobody talks to anybody, thinks of anybody, or cares for anybody, or whatever. Come see. This way. When Jesus saw Nathaniel coming, he said about Nathaniel, Here truly is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. He is a true Israelite in whom there is no guile. How do you know me? Nathaniel asked. Jesus said, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree before Philip called you. And Philip thinks, this guy has got the sort of knowledge of me that I would expect God to have. He could not have known that. And the family says, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. You are the one all the prophets and whatever pointed to and Moses wrote about. You're fulfilling it all. Here's God with us. Walk. Isaiah 7 is happening in front of my eyes. And Jesus said, you believe, because I told you I saw you under the fig tree. You'll see greater things than that. <laughs> and he then added, very truly, I tell you, you will see heaven open, the angels of God, sending and descending on the Son of Man. Son of Man's the way Jesus talks about himself, isn't it? Okay. <clears throat> the big question left hanging there for us by John is this. Where does Peter stand in all of this? Because these guys are all guys finding faith dramatically, and Peter is the guy who's been all talk and has let Jesus down. <coughs> Were you saying something about that earlier on? <laughs> Being all talk and then letting Jesus down when he comes to it. <coughs> you know I mean? Peter needs his relationship with Jesus restored and sorted. And it's going to be, but it needs to happen. See, Peter is standing back. He's normally the one rushing in. He's been curiously silent on the reason Jesus so far. Who's there? Two guys are named who punk up the situation that Peter is in at the moment. They're sorting with Jesus. They are, they trusted, they believe, they're walking, and Peter is Peter is betrayed. The cock has crowed three times, and Peter has denied his Lord three times. But things aren't resolved yet. And John is putting his finger on that because that's coming up later. Okay, that's who, okay, that's who they are. Where are they? I love the way Peter <coughs> says, I'm going to fish it. <laughs> How many domestic disputes have ended with those, those famous words? I'm going fishing. <laughs> and there he goes, he goes fishing. He's disillusioned. He's, he's really cheesed. Jesus is gone and it's all, you know, and then he's gone away. And where are they? They're fishing. Now, some commentators make a bit of a fuss about this. The disciples have left Jerusalem and gone back to Galilee. As if they should never have done it, and that is clearly backsliding and wandering away from the Lord, right? <coughs> Let's be clear. The disciples had gone up with Jesus to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover. Yeah, that's good. And Jesus had eaten the meal with them in or near that city. They'd done Passover, yeah. And the Feast of Unleavened Bread followed on from the Passover and lasted about a week. It was usual for Passover pilgrims to hang around for that, then travel back home in their groups to continue their everyday lives. That was, that was normal group expectation. That's what you expect to happen. And it looks like the disciples, they were there in that upper room locked and Jesus had appeared to them there that week later. You know, that's how long the Feast of Unleavened Bread went on. It looks as if they dribbled then back from the Feast of Unleavened Bread and they've gone back to their normal life, which is the normal expectation. They're getting on the way you're supposed to. Returned to Galilee, where they'd come from, and got on with their everyday life. What's out of order there then? 
And more than that, as he was preparing them for what was coming before he was crucified, Jesus told them that he was going to go ahead of them into Galilee and would meet with them there. I'll be going home early from the Feast of Unleavened Bread, boys. You just drag on behind me and we'll see you there. Fall away, Jesus told them in Mark 14. For it is written, I'll strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But after I've risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. And Peter said, here we go, remember that bit about Peter? Don't let that drop off the side of your head. Peter said, even if all fall away, I will not. And Jesus says, yes. Listen out for the cockerel. Tonight, before the cock crows, Twice ever, you yourself will disown me three times. But Peter insisted emphatically, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. And all the others said the same. There are themes in that that recur through this chapter in John 21. So the disciples, I guess, are actually right, quite right to be where they are geographically. Geographically, they're in the right place. They're right to have left Jerusalem after the end of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, quite legitimate. They've gone back up to Galilee as Jesus directed them, absolutely fine. They've gone about their normal lives again after the festival, precisely what's expected of them. John therefore places them happily on the Sea of Tiberias. The Sea of Galilee in the newer NIVs. Um, John doesn't use that name, he says Tiberias, most of the Sea of Galilee, but it just doesn't matter. Where? Sea of Tiberias. Here's the bigger picture. Here's the whole Israel, Samaria, Judea, whatever. Here's the Dead Sea. Here's the Sea of Galilee. Sea of Tiberias. Here's Tiberias. Here's Capernaum, where Jesus spent so much of his time growing up. And it's up in that area again, where his followers had first known him, where he'd walked and talked with them, where he passed his most intimate moments modelling and teaching the truth to them. But he meets with them again, and he's got still fresh surprises for them as he meets them up there again. Fresh truth for them to teach, and fresh relationship building to do with them. Back to Galilee, back to Capernaum. But you know, <coughs> we do take a function as if truth were all that God has got for us. And that's not all he's got for them. Of course the truth is crucial to it all. But, as we'll see, the end stress of this passage with Peter and restoring Peter, the end stress is about restoring my relationship with him. And that's what he's dragging them back there for. Where are they? At a place with a history doing exactly what they were doing when he first called them. What were they doing? Come on, Peter. Fishing. It's not, not fly rods, is it? No, they want some fish. They actually want some fish. So they use it nets, you know. It's their business. So they use nets. Go on about their normal business again after the pilgrimage to the festival. Doing what they'd done, man and boy. Doing what they knew. Doing what they were proficient at. Their trade, their craft that had fed their families throughout their working lives, their fishing. Do you remember Christ's call to these days? There was John with his brother James in Matthew 4, beside the Sea of Galilee, sorting out their nets after a night's nice commercial fishing, and the others, Peter and John and whatnot, they were just packing up on the water and coming in. And back there in Matthew 4, when all that was going on, Jesus walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he said to two brothers, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter's brother Andrew, casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come follow me, Jesus said. Come follow me. And I'll send you out to fish for people. I'll make you fish for men. And once they left their nets and they followed Jesus. Jesus has been in the business of turning them from being fishers of fish to being fishers of men. Drawing people to the great deep in the kingdom of God. And going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. They were in a boat with their father Zebedee, preparing their nets, mending them after they'd been fishing. And Jesus called them, and immediately they left their boat and their father and followed him on the fishing, said Peter. Jesus comes and he meets them, doing what they'd been doing when he met them first. And now he's about to bring to fruition that initial call. 
they're going to have to win the world for Jesus. So the question at the center of this meeting with Jesus then on the lake that day has got to be this. That's who they were, that's where they were. What's going on? What? So many conversations I've had with people this week have started with the sheep. Yeah. They started with sheep and where they've ended up is... Yeah. And here's Jesus doing what he models for us to do really. Just meet people where they are. Jesus starts with what it is people know or think they know. So often, and here he is, with what they know. But how's it going? Uh, see, that's, that's, that's where the conversation takes a fresh turn. Because it's full of frustration. Full of frustration. So often we meet with people, and Jesus meets with people, at the point of their frustration with the life and the world they've got. I'm afraid of that. They don't realise it's Jesus, remember that? That's really important. And there's this guy out there on the beach in first light, they've been working all night. All night, hard, heavy, manual labour. It's been pointless, and they now feel really stupid because they're fishermen, and a fisherman without fish is what? Skin. Skin, yeah. <laughs> skin. He's, he's also skin, yeah, but he's kind of frustrated, you know. They don't come up in a good mood. <laughs> they don't come up in a good mood at all. And now all they've got in their mind is breakfast, right? Breakfast is what we want. And there's this guy out on the beach in the first light. What is he? What's he doing there? Some sort of beach bum? Oh, and he's a wise guy as well. He's a wise guy because he calls out to them from the beach. <coughs> you know, the NIV of friends. Haven't you any fish? No. No, 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 no. <laughs> he's, he's using the word for children. Paidia. <laughs> now, you could, you could use that in Greek for, you know, boys. If I go into the mountain, I don't say, good morning, gentlemen. My boys, what's happening? Right? Because it's a figure of speech, isn't it? It could be that. But <laughs> there's more to it than that. Because the word for fish that Jesus uses is the word for tiddlers. Haven't you got any little ones? <laughs> right? So Jesus, oh, honestly, it's bizarre when you actually get down to the root of this thing. Jesus is standing on the beach. Well, it be some bloke who slept out there all night. What? What is he? You know? And he's shouting to them. And they're, they're frustrated anyway. And he's like, go on, boys! <laughs> they aren't pleased. How do I know they're not pleased? Listen to the detailed and considered response to, response to his question. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, they answered. Okay. Can't you hear the frustration? Can't you see their gritted teeth? No. One word. No tiddlers. Frustrated preachers because what's happened to all that? No frustrated followers because they can't find him to follow. Where is he? Popping up and disappearing. Frustrated now, even in the job they've done successfully, man and boy, until they went off to be preachers, and now they can't even do that either. And what's worse is that their confidence, even their trust for one another, after all that stuff with cocks crowing and the crucifixion, their trust even for one another lies smashed. At least they had their buddies, but now they're sort of looking at each other a bit odd. And right at the point where the frustration is most intense, some smart aleck on the beach is rubbing their noses in it. As it happens, it's because he's got better stuff in store for them, but they have no way of knowing that at the moment. So here comes the really extreme fishing bit. This is where the extreme fishing begins, because this is where Jesus steps in and things get extreme. Robson Green can't manage going around the world on the telly by doing his extreme fishing program. He can't cope doing that with a bunch of gillies. I call them gillies, but have you seen them? They're an amazing bunch of characters he drags out of the undergrowth who fish in that part of the world and tell him how to do it. Did you get that on iPlayer or something? Did you get that? I've seen bits of it. Seen bits of it. It's a good program, isn't it? It's a boy program, it really is. But these guys are going to listen to a preacher about fishing. The general assumption is that preachers know nothing, of course. Now, hopefully, the preacher knows someone, and in this case, Jesus, he's Jesus, and he is the someone. Okay. Here he goes. 
Early in the morning, Jesus stood in the shore, disciples didn't realise it was him. Friends, where are your tiddlers? No, I don't think. Right, throw your net on the right side of the boat, he says, and you'll find some persons. And when they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the very large number of fish. The disciple of Jesus loved said to Peter, John that is, it's the Lord. And as soon as Simon Peter heard him say, it's the Lord, he, no, listen, I don't get this bit. He wrapped his outer garment round him from taking it off and he jumped into the water. <laughs> Sink. <laughs> What's going on? Wait, would you do that? I mean, you know about boats and things. Would you pull on your heavy overcoat and your wellies and jump over? Um, the guy is just not thinking straight. He's just so desperate for Jesus. It's the Lord. Oh, man, I'm in the water. And he takes a header straight in to be closer to Jesus. The Jesus is let down. The Jesus is betrayed has come back again. To come close to him. So Jesus has appeared at the point of extreme tiredness, extreme frustration, and so often he does. Right when it appears that everything's come undone, he steps in. Into their specialist area, into their field of knowledge. And look what happens here. A stranger, carpentry trained by the way, says you've been using your own breadth and depth of knowledge all night. The fish couldn't see you through those clear waters. Do them dark, because then they can't see you. But now, I'm going to tell you to let your nets over the other side of the boat, where if you can see fish, you've been fishing already. And in spite of the fact you're tired, frustrated, worn out, as well as in emotional turmoil, because of the events of the last three years, particularly last month, and although the sun is up so the fish can see you now, and the element of ambush has been completely lost, at a time when nothing so much as breakfast is on your minds, and you deserved it, and some stranger on the beach has been taunting you, haven't you got any tiddlers yet? And at such a time as that, the unrecognised Jesus says to them, no, then, next over the other side, boys. Children. They have been taunting all night. And what they actually need here is their breakfast. And to do what he asks is going to be completely counterintuitive. Not what their long and hard won experience of their craft can make any sense of at all. More than that, it's clearly irrational. Look down your nets on the other side of the boat. Have you got any idea how clear the waters of the Sea of Galilee are? Decades ago, Helen and I walked in the evening beside the Sea of Galilee at Tiberius. Do you remember, dear? It was a, you had a blog with you about hair. Remember? Where was it? <laughs> and there were fish restaurants. There yeah, were fish restaurants all along the side of the lake. Do you remember this bit? I had a flashback when I was preparing my sermon. And there are these, you know, here are the fish restaurants all along here, and here are the fish in the water. And you can see them because the water is that clear. They were going to make a last, a, 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 a very short final journey of those fish, you know, to the fish restaurants beside the water. What I get at here is that these experienced fishermen have toiled all night without landing a catch in waters they knew terribly well, where well, you can see if there are fish on the other side of the boat now because the sun's come up. And as far as they know at this point, Jesus is a complete smart Alex stranger calling them for something counterintuitive and clearly irrational. Throw your nets out on that other side. If the last few days have bred in them a negative mindset, they're going to miss breakfast with Jesus. If the hardship and the frustration and the bitterness of their recent experience has been allowed to shape their mind, their thinking and their attitude, they're going to miss breakfast with Jesus on the beach. Would you want to miss breakfast with Jesus on the beach that day? No, you would not. But this guy has said, do this. And they haven't bought into a negative view of the world. Now, okay, we'll give it another go. The whole situation is bizarre. So what is it these expert professional fishermen are getting taught? Because it's not a fishing lesson. 
Most days, what's being told them will be of little use, let's put it mildly like that. The lesson that's being taught them is not about fishing. It's a spiritual lesson for everyday living. It's the same lesson that Jesus had been teaching them sort of in units of truth, in, in propositions, propositionally, in purely verbal format, in John 15. Here's how John 15 goes. He is the true vine, his followers are the branches. Great story, make a great sermon. People leave church that morning feeling wonderfully blessed. Right? But as the rubber in that scenario hit the road, not sure. So what follows from this lovely illustration then, Lord? Check John 15, 5. I'm the vine, you're the branches. If you remain in me, and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. That's the point of the vine, the branches. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Here you are, experts in fishing. Look at the state of you. Shattered, all out. Smelly, you've been working all night. Look at the state of you. No fish, no tiddlers. The lesson is one of dependence on Jesus when you're supposed to be the expert. I've never heard of a branch managing anything without the vine. Here's perhaps the biggest lesson we ever get taught by exercising faith in frustration. We learn to live in dependence on God. Not independent of Him, but independence on Him. Why are we frustrated? Why are things humanly hard? Why are we reminded of our human weakness? What is the purpose of us having to pray about our scant resources? Here is the reason. It's because salvation is by God glorifying faith. And so is His people's sanctification. What glorifies God is him doing something utterly remarkable just by the faith of people who are completely not managing. Beyond their own resources. Clearly doing this on God. It glorifies God that it should always be so. It's only John the Divine that we can do anything. And living by faith in a world subjected by sin to frustration is one of the most major providential drivers that keeps us there. Because our reliance often slips away from our God. And without our frustrations driving us back to Him, we can miss out on breakfast on the beach. See, lesson learned. Jesus brings the frustration to a really comfortable end. He gives fish in their nets, and they've still got to work hard when they're tired to achieve bringing that in. And then he gives the food they've been planning to bunk off for when he hailed them. It was hard work to land their catches. But when they've done that and they've landed their catches, they thrive on the hospitality of their God. And his peel? Personal appeal, even to his failure written followers, is such that Peter picks up his kit, takes a head over the water, and swims to the beach just to be closer to this Jesus. There's so much in the Bible about shared meals and Jesus calls them breakfast. You know, what is it about breakfast? Because I'm very about breakfast and sharing breakfast. I've got some, I'm having breakfast with somebody tomorrow morning. I'm looking forward to it. What is that? Breakfast is a great meal, isn't it? You know, it's a parade in the army, you can't, you know, you know if you're not having breakfast, you, you're absent. Mm -hmm. Big problem. So much in the Bible about shared meals. Check it out in the book. Did you check that book, A Meal with Jesus by Tim Chester? Good book. Interesting book, wasn't it? A bit wacky in places. But did I recommend it or what? <laughs> it's unusual in places. But it casts a light that, you know, I pick up on this. So much in the Bible about Jesus sharing meals and reaching out to people. He made the fire. He provided the fish to their labour. And now they get to start off the day after a long difficult night feeding in the presence of Jesus. What a horrendous mistake these tired men would have made if they understandably rejected the call of the stranger on the beach. What understandable? I'm not going to labour the point, but Jesus doesn't always call his people to what seems worldly rational or worldly reasonable. 
He sometimes got something much more exciting than that. Wacky was your word. Yes, it may be. It may be slightly wacky. But it leads to breakfast with Jesus on the beach. What a way to start the day. He's got a right to take us way beyond what looks rationalized. Right, I'm moving quickly to a conclusion. Is that good news, mate? Let's get my bits. Next time, next time. Yeah, next time. You'll have to come next week, you see? There you go. There's the advert. What's the conclusion? What's the question? Are you tired? I'm shattered. Are you frustrated? Yeah. Come and have the tough nuts on the table there. Yes, I'm frustrated. <laughs> Take a moment to ask yourself why. Because it's very easy for a follower of Jesus to live like a skilled secularist. I don't have to do this. Away from Jesus. Because aware of the way things usually work in the world we've lived in for some time, we've experienced it. Perhaps you've become so used to living on your own natural resources, this sounds weird. We do that! Perhaps things are hard, and perhaps it's been tiring, and things are deeply frustrating. Keep listening to the Saki Stranger on the Beach. And keep learning those lessons about violence. Because without him, However skilled, without him, we actually end up doing nothing. Apart from chewing the leg of the table. And there's much more useful things to be done with that frustration.